G'day guys, back with you, Circle. Sorry I've been away for the last week, but been a bit busy with life, and uh, played at an event recently, which plays into today's episode, and some information I want to pass on from the event, as well as a few ideas I've had. The main focus of this episode is going to be the White Scars. I will briefly touch on the Demons of Ruin Storm, uh, if I remember, at some point in the episode. And I just want to talk about the White Scars in 30k, the releases that have come out for them, um, namely the ones that haven't really dropped yet. Uh, so I won't be touching on their Contempt of Dreadnought. And we'll go from there. So, obviously right now I'm showing the two White Scars Praetors. One in Cataphracty Armor, one in Power Armor. The Power Armored guy is armed with the Dao. This is... Interesting, because the White Scars Glaive, I'm just going to call it a Dow Glaive, is a good weapon on Squad Sergeants, Terminator Sergeants especially, but it's not very good on characters. So, certain characters like, oh, I don't know, characters who might have shields perhaps, like Breaching Shields, it's probably a better weapon for. But for the standard Praetor, especially in Terminator armor, it's no good because there's better weapons available, namely the Paragon Blade. Whilst the Paragon Blade is more expensive, for someone in Terminator armor, they can get the second attack. Because it's a specialist weapon, they can take something like a Lightning Core, Power Fist, that sort of thing in the other hand, get a lot of versatility, maybe they take a Chain Fist, get some anti-tank. Of course, it is going to cost you some points to do so, but the option is there. Whereas just having the AP2 plus 1 strength at initiative, it's great. Don't get me wrong, but compared to the Paragon Blade, it's inferior. And yes, in theory, you could wield it one-handed, counts the Power Sword, combine it with a pistol, you might get plus 1 attack. Nonetheless, it's very rare that you'll get into a situation where it's worth doing it. Because often I've found that the plus 1 strength is better than the extra attack because you're more likely to cause wounds, and with the White Scars re-rolling ones to wound, it stacks really well. So overall, as cool and fluffy as it is on characters, it's not super great. There's just better weapons available, guys. Um, so if you are building a White Scars army, I would look at arming my characters with something else. The only situations where I think it really comes into its own is the White Scars Glaive on a Chaplain because the Chaplain comes with the craziest power weapon automatically and you can give him the Glaive on top of that and what you can do is have the Crozius as a Maul and then the Glaive gives you the Sword and Axe options essentially so if you attack with the Maul you'll be striking Strength 6 AP 4 with a minimum of 4 attacks if you strike with the Glaive in one handed Strength Normal AP 3 and 4 attacks and if you want to go for killing something with 2 plus saves then you can swap to the two handed stance, go AP 2 plus 1 strength and drop to 3 attacks. That's actually pretty good on the chaplain, but for everyone else it's pretty mediocre and you start paying a lot of points for it. Uh, I think the only other person I run it on is a librarian because uh, it's a better weapon a lot of the time than what the librarians are armed with. So, force weapons need to actually get force off on them. I do a similar sort of thing, turn their force weapon into a force maul or force stave. Uh, actually, models wise, I do love them. Absolutely love them. I think they're very thematic, very much white scars. Just a shame. The one little thing that's a shame uh, the Praetor, of course, is in Cataphracty armor. But the Ebb and Keshig, our Terminator unit, are not. They're in Tartarus armor. Is that a big deal? Well, yes and no. First of all, Ebb and Keshig come in Terminator armor. It's up to you whether it's Tartarus or Cataphracty, but it depends what you want. If you want survivability, well, Cataphracty, of course. But if you want a bit more mobility, well, then Tartarus. One of the chief things that Tartarus gets that Cataphracty doesn't is the ability to overwatch. Well, you're not going to be doing that with no ranged weaponry, are you? Now, they can 
swap to a power weapon and a combi bolter for free, but then you're sort of losing what makes them unique, and you may as well just take Legion Terminators. Because stats-wise, they're a Legion Terminator. Weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, initiative, all fours. One wound each, two attacks each, ten plus, or ten on the leadership. They're Legion Terminators. Do they have any buffs? Well, yes, they're stubborn. They have chosen warriors, so each and every one of them can accept a challenge. They have Feel No Pain which is very strong, but you are paying the points for it, 45 points a model, that's not cheap. They're also a support unit, so what does that mean? Well it means if you have compulsory elite slots, such as in some special missions, they'll say this elite slot is um, part of your army list and must have a certain amount of elite units fill it up before you can you know, go and take the cool toys. Now, generally, it'll be things like Legion Terminators, Contemptors, that sort of thing that you can fill that slot with. Can't use these guys. They cannot be your compulsory elite's choice. Now, does this occur very often? No, not at all. But it is something to remember does exist. So, that is a limiting factor. But that's not the biggest limiting factor. The biggest limiting factor is this rule called the Karash, which is a unit with this special rule, never counts as a scoring unit, which is problematic, as everyone would know, I would like a scoring unit every 500 points in my armies. I think that's a really good rule of thumb to follow. Well, if I'm adding Legion Terminators, one of the best things about them is that they're really tough to kill scoring units. These guys don't score. On the other hand, you never score victory points for the destruction of them. Well, that's great if it's a kill points mission, but for things like First Blood, it still counts. So that rule is very rarely actually going to help you out, except in a literal kill points mission. And lastly, in addition, a unit with this special rule may not be joined by any model that does not also have the Karash special rule. Well, nobody, not one other model in the force has that rule. Chinzar. Yeah, I always called him Quinn, but I do know the Asian pronunciation is Chin. Uh, doesn't have the Karash special rule. Solomon Khan. He doesn't have the Karash special rule. Jagatai Khan does not have the Karash special rule. I am holding Book 8 in my hands and flipping through the pages, just double checking these things. There is no way of actually giving any character in the White Scars the Karash special rule. Therefore, no character can join the Eben Keshik. The only exception, of course, being Chinzar, who can take a special unit that he can join as part of his um, Master of the Keshik special rule. He can get a single one that becomes a replacement for a Terminator command squad, and he can join them. But that's the exception to the rule. So... I can't really give them a thumbs up as a unit. They have this great offensive ability in the fact that, okay, the whole squad can strike AP2, Strength 5, add initiative with two attacks each, three on the charge. Okay, that's great. That's going to cut down Terminators from other legions. But if you're running to, say, Stone Gauntlet forces, especially if they've got shields, uh, Storm Shields, that is, um, Storm Shield equipped cataphractic terminators or a fact it can be tartarus the way they've faq the imperial fists so why wouldn't you they're just better uh they're going to get three plus invol saves against you and they're going to be toughness five so you're only going to wound them on fours that's not a fight you really want to take is it so not very good for that they only have one wound each so they can't really go toe to toe with things like pyroclasts or, uh, oh, sorry, I should say Fire Drakes, not Pyroclasts. That's the Salamanders, Terminators with the Storm Shield and Thunder Hammer. They will just squash this unit. Uh, Phoenix Terminators, I'd say, are probably the most even fight. If they get the charge off, it's going to be superior. But if you get the charge off, you're going to be superior because they're just not going to be able to hurt you, whereas you're going to carve into them. But if they get the charge off, their bonuses on the charge are probably going to weigh in the Empress Children's favour. And of course, turn two, you're going to win the turn two combat. That's just the way it goes. But at 45 points a model, they are pricey, and I'm just not seeing any value here. 
Now the thing is, you can start upgrading things like the power glaive to power fists and combi bolters at 10 points each. It, it really gets expensive. There's no chain fist option for the unit, so anti-tank just isn't there. Uh, you may take a grenade harness. I think it's always worth taking a single grenade harness on your terminators. It's just remembering to use it is the hard part. Um, I'm pretty good with remembering it, but a lot of people don't, and they end up making their terminators charge through difficult terrain and fighting lasting combat. Not very good. Uh, and any model may exchange their combi bolter for a combi weapon at plus 15 points a model. However, to do that, you have to swap from the glaive in the first place, from the glaive to an axe, sword, mace, whatever, and combi bolter. So you'd end up putting the points to 60 points for a single model, which is a Legion Terminator in stats, but with feel no pain, and Chosen Warrior special rule. I'm not wowed by the unit. I'm really not. Um, especially because of the fact that I cannot join characters to it. Something like a chaplain joined with this unit is a game changer. Um, also the fact that they can't fill your compulsory elite slots. In those games where you're forced to have elites, these are the sort of fun units you want to take. Well if you can't take them, that kind of defeats the purpose. So overall, I'm going to get two units of five for my army. Um, just for the bigger games, but I can't recommend them. I know it took me like seven minutes to get through that, guys, but that's just the crux of it. So I do apologize. Alright, what about the Leviathan Dreadnought? I think I can speak for everyone ever uh, who has looked at White Scars and say, why did they get a Leviathan before Iron Warriors, Iron Hands, um, World Eaters, Space Wolves, these legions that are all like combat or mechanized focused should be the ones who are getting a Leviathan Dreadnought first. The White Scars is very... Huh? Especially because we don't have any bonuses that we can really give the unit. Um, swift Action. That applies to... Well, it applies to all of our units. Any model which unit with this special rule ends the movement phase in at least 6 inches or 12... Uh, sorry. If you move your max distance on a unit, then you get re-rolls of a 1 to wound, if you fail to wound. That's cool. But it's for models with the Legionis Astartes White Scars rule. Which is... Not necessarily Dreadnoughts, is it now? Because they don't have it. So that's not very helpful. Uh, the Eye of the Storm... Uh, army whose white has ward is the white scars special rule adds plus one to the seize the initiative as well as the first reserves roll of each turn I love that special rule the only time it would come in handy with something like a leviathan is if it's in a drop pod getting a two plus drop pod uh, in turn one that could be very handy oh. <laughs> it's rough it's rough guys there is no real rules here. Um, you may not run more heavy support choices than fast attack. Well, that's a heavy support choice. Um, don't forget, if you're running the Rite of War, which makes Dreadnoughts troops. Uh, I forget which it is. Wrath of the Ancients or Fear of the Ancients, something like that it's called. You're going to struggle with White Scars. So, yeah... Basically, a talent of Leviathans starts eating up your force orb slots bad. The only time I could see people using one of these is the same time everyone else does. Zone Mortalis, taking a single one of these in their army, uh, where the restrictions don't apply. It would be good, because say Leviathan Dreadnought, they're always good, but you compare it to other legions, like Bon Angels with Assault Cannons for nipples. That's better. Iron Warriors, they're going to have extra armor built in. That's just better. Um, Iron Hands, it would have Blessed Auto Simulacra, I believe. So, they're all superior. And if you take Salamanders, then you can get buffs against Melter Weapons and that sort of thing. If you're taking a Rite of War. It really has nothing to offer. And the thing is, with White Scars, you're not there to fight with Dreadnoughts and try and punch people in the face, like other legions. 
All their rules revolve around moving the maximum speed possible each turn. And this will lead me into the Golden Keshi. Uh, so, without further ado, let's just get to that. The lovely models of the Golden Keshi in their Shamshir jet bikes, which, if regular Scimitar jet bikes are dick bikes, these are circumcised dick bikes. Make of that what you will. Now, remembering, you move your max distance on a model with the Legion and Astartes White Scars rule, you reroll fail to wound of a one with all attacks. That means you want to move your bikes 12 inches. You want to move your infantry 6 inches. Born in the saddle, all White Scars with the bike or jet bike unit type have the skilled rider special rule. So, again, buffs towards bikes. As much as it's viable to play White Scars on foot with massed infantry, it is no better than running any other legion with mass infantry on foot. Your rules and your real buffs come from bike units. Think of this, uh, a squad of jet bikes with plasma cannons. Move them 12 inches, re-rolling ones to wound with plasma cannons. Yeah, that's good. That's real good. And you can jump into and out of difficult terrain without giving a shit because you automatically pass your dangerous terrain rolls with them. So really good units. None of these bonuses apply to Dreadnoughts, and very few of these apply to infantry. So straight away, you can't build White Scars like you do other Legions. You can't go for the, oh, I want a bunch of Breacher squads in Rhinos. I mean, you can physically do it, and it won't necessarily be bad, but you're kind of tying one hand behind your back doing so. That'd be like going Raven Guard and going for a close combat oriented tactical marine army. It's not what they're built for. Uh, going Elf Legion and trying to go tank heavy and not taking advantage of your mutable tactics. Okay? Uh, salamanders and not taking any flame weapons. White Scars without bikes and bike centric builds is a very weird beast. And I know because I just played it in a tournament with just one unit of bikes. And the one unit of bikes I took was the Golden Keshi. So what do I think of the Golden Keshig? This is without a doubt the best single unit in the entirety of Warhammer that goes fluff and rules combined. That They're just perfect. All of the rules that have been come up with for the unit are perfect on the tabletop to represent the fluff, the background of the unit. And the unit is fantastic at what it does. High risk, high reward unit. And it makes you, forces you in fact to play them like the White Scars themes. You have to stay on the flanks. You have to outflank. And if you don't, you will lose the unit incredibly quickly. It's only a unit of six models at 40 points each. Cheaper than the Terminators, I'll add. Their toughness five, yes. They have two plus saves, yes. That's it though, they're one wound models. So you basically just, if you can kill a toughness five space marine, you can kill one of these jet bikes. The plasma guns, things like that, uh, weapons which ignore cover saves, are brutal weapons against these guys. Um, the Sikran Arcus, for example, is a great weapon against them with re-rolling successful cover saves against its weapons fire. Um, yeah, the Golden Keshig, wow. So, to quickly run people through the rules, their weapon skill 5, they're 1 attack each, but they have 2 on the squad champion, and they do all come with a chainsword or combat blade and a bolt pistol, so technically they get 2 attacks each. They've all got artificer armor. Don't know why, they're on a jet bike, it gives them a 2 plus anyway, so, strange. They have Shamshir jet bikes with scatterbolt launchers, and the hit and run special rule. So the Shamshir jet bikes where I'll start, it's a scimitar jet bike. The difference being its main weapon. Instead of being a heavy boltar, Volkite Culver and that sort of thing, it's a scatterbolt launcher, which I suppose it looks like a missile launcher, but the best way to think of it is a shotgun. And it's basically a heavy flamer. Strength five, AP four, assault one, shred and pinning. By the way, I forgot the shred and the pinning parts of it when I was using it. I was literally just using it like a heavy flamer. 
So it would have been a little bit more effective if I remembered that. But, considering you re-roll ones to wound anyway, if you move 12 inches, which you will, that's pretty good. Uh, very good weapon for Overwatch. So what I did with this weapon, especially with these bikes on the weekend, was I would run them up to the side of an enemy unit, hit them with as many shots as I could, and then try and bait a counter charge the next turn and do it all over. And then use the superior speed of the bikes, that 12 inch move, to get into the back lines and start assaulting vehicles whilst the rest of their army is trying to attack my main force. So in the case of when I've played World Eaters, they're running their Marines across the table and they've got their Sikorans and Vindicators in sort of the middle and back line. Well, he can't exactly turn around those red butchers and start coming back to try and protect his vehicles, so he had no choice but to keep coming towards the rest of my force, which just gave my jet bikes free reign in the back lines, which ended very predictably. Why does it end very predictably? Because each one of these bikes has a Notos Power Lance, or Contos Power Lance. It makes you Strength 7, AP 2, with Sunder, Murderous Strike, and Concussive on the charge. The downside, you only ever get one attack. So, you cannot charge things like Terminators. They will destroy you. You cannot charge things like uh, characters. They will destroy you. But... If it's one or two Terminators, or a lone character, or just a couple of Marines on foot, you definitely want to charge them, because your attacks are at initiative 10 on the charge. Now the downside is, when it swaps to turn 2 of the combat, they go down to AP4 and they stay at your strength. You only ever get the one attack, but you know, concussive, murderous strike, sixes to wound, instant death, that's not bad. Not bad at all. You could use these pretty effectively against things like Thalax to knock wounds off them without them getting armor saves, but you get only the one attack. So maybe it's more preferable to swap to your bolt pistol and chainsaw combo and get the two attacks at them and try and go for more wounds. Dunno, don't have the perfect answer there because I haven't fought Thalax with them yet. But I can tell you this, a uh, World Eaters champion with jump pack, pimped out, got charged by five of these, and ceased to exist, just evaporated on contact. Uh, the same five went on to instantly kill a Sikoran Arcus on touching it, and the same with a Vindicator, especially because the opponent hadn't moved the vehicles, and because he hadn't moved them, they were automatic hits. So it was just five strength seven automatic hits with Sunder. Forced to glance rear armor, with a reroll, basically. And they're AP2, so the vehicles do explode on contact. Fantastic, fantastic unit. Yes, you can swap their chainsaw or combat weapon to power weapons for 10 points a model. That could be very strong, using the lances for the charge and then using power weapons for the next turn. Or perhaps you charge something like Space Marine Tactical Marines. Maybe it's just worth going with the Power Sword to lead off and going for the three attacks per guy and just carving up a unit of Marines. Definitely possible, but you never want to overcommit by spending a lot of points on this unit, going deep into the enemy's line and then being surrounded and completely obliterated. Because remember, six models, toughness five, two up saves. That's not enough to stay alive. And the sergeant may take a thunder hammer. That's on top of the lance, by the way. So, I don't know. I don't plan on ever using this unit to hang around for a challenge where that thunder hammer might come in handy. So, I'm going to say no, guys. That's my quick pre-release, -re uh, pre preview, uh, actual hands-on use of the unit. Uh, the best unit, I think, ever designed in all of Warhammer. And I really do mean it, because this unit does exactly what it says on the box, and plays exactly to what this Legion rules say it should. You cannot go charging in the middle of someone's army, but for harassing the flanks and being a typical Mongol, definitely does it, and is fantastic. So, let's finish off the 
White Scar's Super Land Speeder, as we're going to call this. This is the Kizargan Assault Speeder. And this is the one I said in the What Broke the... Uh, not what the Broke the Fans, sorry, the Getting Started in White Scar's. So this I would supplement it into those heavy support slots. Uh, or, well, it's fast attack, but it's basically a heavy support unit. Because it's got two Reaper Auto Cannons and an Assault Cannon. I don't know what the go is with the missile launchers up there because the BBDA, Backblast Danger Area, is probably going to concuss or kill both of the pilots when you fire the Hunter Killers. Uh, but 5 power wise for 105 points a pop, you're getting 4 Twin Linked Auto Cannon shots and 6 Assault Cannon shots each turn. That is an incredible amount of firepower. It's armor 12 on the front as well. So you're safe from things like bolters and heavy bolters. People have to start using assault cannons or better just to try and hull point this thing. Uh, and also, in close combat, it has the graph backwash rule, which comes from the custodes, which means enemies that attack you are at minus two to hit. So as long as this vehicle moved at all in the preceding turn, the best it can be hit on is fives. That's great. So what a fantastic unit. Of course, this, the Golden Keshig, and the Ebon Keshig are all yet to drop. And I believe the Leviathan as well is yet to drop. Don't even think they're available for pre-order. So, bit of a shame. Um, White Scars are in a really good position. But there's definitely work that could be done. I think the Ebon Keshig need that Karash rule rectified with an FAQ. Uh, there is one other rule that's really been bugging me that needs rectifying, and I think it just came down to a oversight when they wrote the rules, and that is the Chagorian Brotherhood Rite of War, which is the jet bike specific Rite of War for the White Scars and bikes. So, obviously, the Rite of War you want to use as White Scars player. The Army's Warlord must be mounted on either a Space Marine bike or Simtar jet bike. Well... One of the bike options for your characters is the Shamshir, which replaces the Scimitar. If you take it, your Praetor can't ride it and be the Warlord, and therefore can't take the Rite of War. Rules as written. Now, I would say that's not what's intended, but that's rules as written, and people will debate you on it. And also, going off rules as written, Jagtai Khan himself. He rides a Sojotsu pattern void bike which is not a outrider bike and it is not a scimitar jet bike therefore Jagatai Khan cannot lead a bike force of white scars now I would say that's very much not as intended I'd say they've cut pasted the Chagorian Brotherhood Rite of War directly from book 6 where it was first revealed and they didn't edit in those two bike types so that needs fixing Fix that, maybe get rid of the Artefsar armor off the Golden Keshig. Uh, the Ebon Keshig need the Karash rule fixed, definitely fixed. Um, the, I wonder with this Shamshir jet bike, it's almost like it, the fact that it just is a normal Scimitar jet bike, gets the Scatterbolt launcher, you almost could have just said. They just have scimitar jet bikes and just gain the option of taking a Shamshir uh, Scatterbolt launcher instead of giving them a different bike that looks almost identical. It just seems a bit odd to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Please drop these speeders and terminators and bikes quickly, Forge World. I'd really appreciate that. Um, also, I don't like the look of the blades. The handles are fine. I pictured more like the old 40k white scars blades and that dowel shape. I used a lot of that. These are more like a Felcata or something or a weird scimitar type weapon from like a Popeye cartoon or a, the old Disney Aladdin film slapped onto the end of a stick. It just looks a bit weird. Don't hate it, just not my exact tastes. I'm just nitpicking now. Anyway, Demons of the Ruin Storm was one last thing I wanted to cover before I finished up this episode. On Saturday last week, I sat down with a group of people of Melbourne Heresy community at the event we were at, and we measured out on a 6x4 table using a standard long edge deployment on each side what would the 
absolute bare minimum need to be in order for you to deny a Demon of the Ruined Storm player deploying anything on a table? And the answer was two objectives. Two single objectives or two infiltrating units, any combination of the above. It will be physically impossible for someone to deploy the Demons of the Ruined Storm on the tabletop. Where do you place those two markers? Uh, if you divide your tabletop into two by two tiles, I believe it's approximately four inches in uh, on the two tile edges. And yeah, those two objectives there create a zone which combined with the board edges, proximity of enemy units, etc., it becomes physically impossible to deploy anything onto the tabletop for Demons of the Ruin Storm. Yeah, broken. Broken beyond belief. So, the sooner they fix that, and I did speak with people what they thought would be good uh, fixes for it, because, you know, they're the community, they're my community, and I want to listen to them. Uh, I'm a part of the community, I'm not above them. And we all sort of agreed that, okay, they should be allowed to be placed near objectives, they should be allowed to be walked through, they shouldn't be impassable terrain, but obviously they should be dangerous terrain, and perhaps if you're a psyker and you go into it, you just automatically take a Perils of the Warp for walking into a Ruin Storm token, template, whatever you want to call it, uh, because in games like Zone Mortalis, the Ruin Storm templates can literally be used to shut down the tabletop completely. Just by placing them in a certain corridor, you could block the enemy from moving through that corridor and therefore preventing their access to the rest of the board and having free reign. Not fair, very whack, but unfortunately these things do exist. And sometimes you may be forced to deploy your icon there, not through being whack, but by simply following the rules. It may be the only free space available and where you happen to put it breaks the game for the other player. And the same thing could happen with objectives. It's very hard once you're getting to four, five, six objectives, to place them onto a tabletop and leave enough room for the other guy. Uh, keeping in mind, you have to keep t objectives 12 inches away from each other uh, and more than six from a boardage, so it's becoming very difficult for the other player to place their Ruin Storm icons because every objective you put down a board is a 24 inch zone of can't deploy. Can't even touch that zone edge. And when you're template you have to deploy is a five inch wide template that is brutal so let people deploy near objectives just don't let them deploy on objectives with their ruin storm templates and you'll fix a lot of the problems there see you all next time